Is the Sabbath relevant for Christians today? And if it is, what should that look like in our lives? And how does the Sabbath relate to Sunday, the day that Christians have historically gathered together for corporate worship? In my interview today, I sit down with Guy Waters to discuss God's original purpose for the Sabbath, where we first see it in our Bibles, and how the idea of Sabbath rest recurs throughout both the Old and New Testaments, being inextricably connected to salvation history and the life and ministry of Jesus. Guy serves as the James M. Baird Jr. Professor of New Testament and Academic Dean at Reformed Theological Seminary Jackson. He's also a teaching elder in the Mississippi Valley Presbytery of the PCA and the author of The Sabbath as Rest and Hope for the People of God from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Guy, thank you so much for joining me today on the Crossway Podcast. Thank you for having me, Matt. This Good to be here. Second time getting to chat. And um, yeah, today we're going to talk about the Sabbath, this mm-hmm. um, this really important idea, a concept in the Bible. And yet it's also one that I think is mysterious for a lot of Christians. We don't always know what to do with it fully. I, just a, a big picture question to start us off. Isn't the Sabbath just an Old Testament concept? that Jesus sort of fulfilled, in a sense, and, and, and therefore it's, it's not really relevant for us. How would you respond to a question like that from a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people, if we were to play a word association game mm. and I were to throw out Sabbath, probably Israel yep. would, would come to mind right. straight away. Jewish people. I, exactly, because we, we know even today how uh, conscientiously Jewish people observe the Sabbath in many parts of the world. We know, of course, the Sabbath is explicit in the Old Testament laws Mm -hmm. and factored into the ministry of Jesus in the first century. His enemies would use the Sabbath as an opportunity to try to trick him or trap him or oppose him. It seemed like it was almost always, in the ministry of Jesus, the Sabbath is almost always something that's brought up by the religious leaders of the day who were against him. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that, I think, has um, contributed to forming a certain impression Mm. of the Sabbath. And absolutely, the Sabbath is in the Old Testament, and we certainly meet the Sabbath in the ministry of Jesus. And we'll say more about that in a minute. But I think two things we need to keep in view— In the first place, the Sabbath is in the law of God, the Torah, that God gave through Moses to Israel. But that's not where it first shows up. Mm. We first meet it all the way back in the opening chapters of Genesis. God creates the world in six days. He rests the seventh. And that's given to humanity as a pattern Mm. for the way we're to order our lives Mm. week to week and... God is telling us something important. He has made us as his image bearers to work, but God didn't make us merely to work. Work has as its goal that we lay down the labors of the six days and that we worship God and have fellowship with God. That's why God made us, that we would worship him and enjoy fellowship with Mm. him. And so at the creation, the weekly Sabbath was given as a reminder and a help to keep us focused on this is what God made me for. Yeah. Preeminently, chiefly, God has made me for fellowship with him and to worship him. Mm. So someone might respond to that by saying that the word word Sabbath isn't actually used in that creation account. Is that correct? And, And if so, how would you respond to that? The noun Sabbath does not appear in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. But the verb that's translated God resting Mm. is cognate. That is, it's formed from the same root Mm. as the noun Sabbath. Okay. And when we get to Exodus 20, when God tells Israel in the fourth command, I want you to rest, he points back to his pattern. For God worked six days and rested the seventh. Mm. You therefore do the same. So the giving of the Sabbath law in, in the Decalogue, or in yeah, the giving of the law to Israel, there's an explicit mentioning of the creation days. Exactly, and before God gives Israel the commandments of the law, 
in Exodus 20 and following. We had a really telling glimpse a few chapters earlier. Mm. They're in the wilderness, Exodus chapter 16, they're between Egypt and Sinai, and we're told that Israel refrained from working on the Sabbath day. They, they gathered uh, food six days, and they rested mm. the seventh. Is there evidence, or should we understand um, that that was a, uh, an informal practice that Israel was observing uh, before they actually received the Decalogue? The question is a good one. Mm. I take that to mean, given what comes afterwards, just a few chapters, that the Sabbath was already something that was ingrained in the practice and life of God's people. Mm, Interesting. And in light of what we've seen in Genesis 2, and we connect that with Exodus 20, it's something that's not unique to Israel, but it's something that is intended for all human beings. Yeah. So do you think that then suggests that the fact that there is this idea of Sabbath baked into the creation account itself, does that, is that part of the reason that you would then say that Christians today need to be then thinking about the Sabbath? It, it starts to, there's implications for us as believers in the New Testament. Absolutely. And I think we go a couple different directions with that. One is to look at the way the New Testament reflects back on the creation in light of Christ. And we see in particular, looking at Genesis to begin with, after Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, God resting the seventh day and blessing it, rendering it holy, God calls Adam in the garden, and he tells him, you were not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Mm. And Adam was enjoying fellowship, communion with God in the garden, and that arrangement was a test, a temporary test. And if Adam had remained faithful to God, then he would have entered into permanent and unbroken fellowship. Mm. And not just Adam, but the New Testament tells us in places like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, Adam was the representative of humanity. And and so he would have brought us with him into that confirmed and permanent fellowship and communion with God. But of course we know that didn't happen. He sinned and we sinned in him. And that arrangement later in Genesis 2 is connected with the principle in Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3 where God is saying, human beings, I have made you for fellowship and worship. And what he does with Adam is to say, this is how we're going to get there permanently and in a way that you're not going to lose it. Mm. Now, the whole thing could have ended there, but it didn't because it's not going to be Adam who brings us to that place. It's going to be the last Adam. It's going to be Jesus Christ who brings us to that place. And so what Christ does, the New Testament tells us, is that he wins for us eternal life, and he deals with all the consequences of our sin through his death on the cross. And we learn that he brings his people to the very place that Adam should have brought human beings in the first place. Mm. And as Hebrews is thinking about this in the fourth chapter, he, the writer says something very telling. He says, thinking about the work of Christ and bringing people to rest, since there remains a Sabbath rest, for the people of God. So he pulls up that idea of Sabbath. Exactly. So he's comparing, the writer's comparing the people of God now under the new covenant to Israel in the wilderness. They're between Egypt and Canaan, and we're a people on the way. We're pilgrims, and Christ has won for us that everlasting rest, and we continue to enjoy the weekly Sabbath rest as a reminder and refreshment 
of that rest that lies ahead of Mm. us. So the work of Christ does bring to fulfillment all that the Sabbath was pointing to from the very beginning. And so what our weekly experience of the Sabbath, as we, we gather with God's people in fellowship and worship, what that reminds us is this is what God made me for, and this is where I'm going. Mm. We don't get that message in the world. Yeah. And so God, in his mercy, gives us a weekly reset. This is who I am, and this is where I'm going mm. in Jesus Christ. Would you say that uh, the Sabbath itself, that, that, that six days of work and one day of rest and that trajectory we see even at, in the creation account, does that in a certain sense then prefigure this broader idea of rest that, you know, we need redemption, we need a, an eternal rest from, uh, that is like the culmination of our, our own bondage and slavery and in sin. Is there a certain kind of prefiguring of salvation history that we see in the seven days of creation in your mind? Well, it's telling that in the parallel to Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, In Exodus 20, when God tells his people to work six days and rest the seventh, he points all the way back to his own example Mm. at the creation. In Deuteronomy, he says, the reason I want you to work six days and rest the seventh is because I redeemed you out of bondage in Egypt. So creation, Exodus 20, redemption, Deuteronomy 5. Mm. And the rest and the life that Christ has won for us is the rest and life of our salvation. Mm. And that's, that's what we're waiting for, is the full experience yeah. of the redemption that Christ has purchased for us, the rest that we have begun to enjoy, but we will only fully enjoy when Christ returns and brings all things to completion. Yeah, yeah, that's so beautiful. Let's jump ahead to the Ten Commandments, the, the giving of the Decalogue, uh, and then it's one of the most important references to the Sabbath in the Bible. And something I, I never realized before actually preparing to talk with you today is that of all the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment to honor the Sabbath is, I believe, the longest commandment, at least in English, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a lot of time that is spent explaining kind of the why of the commandment. Uh, And the only other commandment that comes even close to that in terms of length is the second about not making any graven images. Why do you think there's such an emphasis on the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments? Should we read any significance into the fact that there's so much space given to that? It's telling the way the commandment comes to us, remember the Sabbath day Mm. to keep it holy. And that that command, remember, I think is all important. Mm. God doesn't want us to be in some rote or mechanical fashion to be going about particular duties and fill a 24-hour period. Yeah. He wants us to remember. What does he want us to remember? He wants us to think back to creation. He wants us to look to redemption, accomplish, being applied, and consummated in Christ. Mm. And, and that, that's really the whole scope of human history, and that's getting at the very core of who we are as image bearers Mm. and what God has destined us to be. So when you think about the Sabbath from that light, it's bringing everything together in in one place. Mm. And it's a, a weekly way for God to say, let's go back to first things so that you can go out into the world the other six days and live for me and be productive remembering that this is not what it's all about. Yeah. And that we can sometimes boil down the Sabbath, even in our understanding of what it was intended for for Israel, as just a, a very pragmatic and, and understandable and helpful thing of mm-hmm. you guys need to rest. You can't just work all the time. You, you are limited, finite creatures, and right. you need physical rest from your labors. But it seems like you're saying there's a, a lot more to it than just that. There's a, a theological significance to why Israel was commanded to observe this day. Absolutely. And want to affirm what you've said, we do need physical bodily rest. We Mm. live in an exhausted culture. And part of that is we have ramped up into a 24-7 mode. Mm. 
and there's no exit ramp. Mm. And that's one of the beauties of this day is here's one day where I get physical rest for my body. And we, we don't want to take that away in the slightest. Yeah. Would, you that, would, you, would you say that's part of God's intentions for the Sabbath? I, I would say so. It is, it is to be a day of rest and refreshment. But then I would want to say in the same breath that that rest and refreshment is inevitably spiritual Mm. because the reason God wants us to set some things down is so that we can take other things up, Mm. particularly fellowship, worship, not as burdens, but as matters of delight. Mm. And those things should bring refreshment to the soul even as we are enjoying and experiencing the rest that comes in our bodies when we lay down the labors of the other six days. Yeah. So that this kind of then segues into this other question we've sort of been dancing around as t- in terms of how the Sabbath is relevant, how we should apply this idea of Sabbath as Christians today. And uh, obviously the, the Sabbath in the Old Testament was on Saturday, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Christians celebrate the Lord's Day on Sundays. Right. So is 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 the celebration uh, corporate worship that we do on Sundays? Is that a direct, uh, ex, you know, extension of this idea of Sabbath, or are they two distinct ideas that are overlapping? Uh, how should we think about those two things? It's a great question, and you made an accurate, astute observation. The Sabbath f- fell from the creation of the world through the Old Testament on Saturday, Christians have set apart the first day of the week, Sunday, as our day of of worship and rest. And the reason is, if you read the New Testament, comb through the New Testament, you get these indicators in places like Acts chapter 20, 1 Corinthians 16, where the church under the direction of the apostles, is meeting together on the first day of the week. It's what the Apostle John calls the Lord's Day. Now, every day is Mm. the Lord's Day, but there's one day that's particularly his. It's this first day. Is that connected to the resurrection in any sense? Absolutely, Mm. because when you go back to, you ask the question, just that question, why this day? Why is this day so important? You go particularly to John's Gospel, and you read John chapter 20, there's a phrase, it keeps coming up again and again. You can see it clearly in English, on the first day of the week, Mm. on the first day of the week. That's when Christ rose from the dead. That's when the risen Christ appears to his apostles. So it is the resurrection that marks this day Mm. and stamps this day. Now step back a little bit. When we think about the Sabbath, from the creation up until the resurrection, we are remembering God's work of creation. What is the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It is new creation. Mm. It is the way in which God brought creation to its intended consummation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So what at first glance seems to be a very jarring change, we're we were observing the Sabbath on this day, and now we're observing it on this day, really reflects where we are in redemptive history. It reflects what God has done in Christ. So we are, yes, we are continuing to remember God's work of creation. We especially remember the work of new creation in the resurrection and with it Mm. the death of Jesus Christ. Are there specific passages in the New Testament that that make that connection between the Lord's Day, this day of corporate worship for the church, with the Sabbath? Or is that more of a theological kind of connection that we make as we look at the whole picture? Well, I think when you come into the New Testament, we presume that God's people continue to gather weekly to worship him. Which was going back in... It was an established practice in Judaism. People were gathering in synagogues a- on Saturdays. That's right. And so this, this goes deep back into the Old Testament itself. So we're not starting something new. We're really carrying over yeah. something that had been done from the beginning. And we, we don't see the church, 
gathering on the sixth day of the week, we consistently see them gathering on the first day of the week. Mm. And you get a little snapshot in Acts 20, the church in Troas, Paul purposefully delays, he's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, he delays his travels so that he can meet with the church on the first day of the week. What do they do when they come together? He preaches the word and they observe the Lord's Supper together as God's people. And so whenever you see those references to the first day of the week, like 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, on the first day of the week, when you come together, have that collection ready. Yeah. He, he's just assuming, oh, yes, you're going to gather on the yeah, first day it, of the it week. It definitely seems like it's already happening at that point. That's right. Yeah. So we don't expect there to be a long formal argument for Christians gathering on the first day of the week. What you're witnessing is the people of God under the apostles who are worshiping God as they have always done, now in light of the finished work of Christ, crucified and raised from the dead. Mm, mm. So let's let's dig into a little bit of the question that I'm sure many have wondered before. Okay, I I believe, I I accept what you're saying about uh, the Sabbath continues on for the Christian on Sundays, and, and part of that is gathering together corporately to worship. I think a question could be, though, why don't we observe other facets of the Sabbath, like observe the full law and all of the things it says about what not to do and what you are allowed to do? There's, I wonder if you could start by summarizing what Israel was commanded with regard to the Sabbath, because it's not just this vague spiritual uh, encouragement to reflect on God. There's actually specific things. And then how, did, uh, how, do, how does that change? Why does that change for Christians today? Great question. So we, we go back to first things. God gave the, the Sabbath at the creation. It's not unique to Israel. However, when God reveals more about the Sabbath to Israel, it takes on uh, some added features that reflect what God was doing in that period of redemptive history. And in some, he was preparing his people, he was preparing the world for the coming of Christ. So there are things that come to be attached to the Sabbath that we no longer observe now in light of the finished work of Christ. Mm. That would be true of many things in the Old Testament laws. So, for example, uh, the civil punishments, executing someone for violating the command to work, that's not something that is done, period, Mm. in the New Covenant Church. Or think of the whole calendar that is built around the Sabbath uh, in sequences of sevens, all the feasts and festivals. Mm. That was designed to teach Israel about God's work of salvation and his work of salvation particularly centered in the work of Christ. Mm. How would you summarize Jesus' teaching on the Sabbath? As we've already discussed, uh, some of his most bitter opponents Mm -hmm. often kind of pointed to the Sabbath and his violation of the Sabbath as, you know, a charge against him. So what was Jesus actually teaching, and was he in any sense breaking the Sabbath as laid out in the Old Testament law? What Jesus does is is so insightful and pastoral, because the only way that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath was he was breaking the Sabbath as it had been misinterpreted Mm. by the teachers and leaders of his people. And in reality, Jesus never broke the Sabbath. He never granted them that point. In fact, he stressed, I am the one who is truly honoring this day. And you are the ones, by your, your, your rules that not, God never gave you, are showing the hardness of your hearts and that you don't understand mm-hmm. and embrace this day. Because they had added lots of, uh, lots of rules to uh, at least outwardly to protect the Sabbath? That's right. So uh, God says don't work on the Sabbath, and you know, the Pharisees ran to town with that. Mm. And so it, it, the prohibition on work includes the man Jesus heals picking up his pallet and walking. Mm. Or Jesus. So, so that was never, you would say that was not what the Old Testament prohibitions of work would have entailed. No, 
being healed and picking up your bed. No, yeah. J- Jesus is uh, couldn't be clearer uh, that what he is doing is in keeping with uh, entirely uh, both the letter and spirit of the Sabbath. And he calls himself in Matthew 12, the Lord of the Sabbath. Mm. So he's not abolishing the Sabbath. It'd be a strange thing for a Lord to do. Yeah. He is af- asserting his authority to say, this is what we do and don't do on the Sabbath. Mm. And so his teaching to the Pharisees is a way of saying, you have really misunderstood, profoundly misunderstood what this day is about. When you accuse me of breaking this day, all I'm breaking is your rules. I'm not breaking the command as God gave it. And as in many other places, as he sums up in another place, he says, you you just don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. Mm. Well, and, and as you said, when we connect the Sabbath going back to creation and just the broader picture that emerges in the New Testament, with the Sabbath being this sign of God's coming redemption, and it makes all the more the charge that Jesus healing people who were blind or lame on the Sabbath was, yeah, that, that was, in a sense, also really fitting with this idea of Sabbath. That's right. And just what you've said illustrates, I think, the difference between the way the Pharisees were treating the Sabbath and the way Jesus treats the Sabbath. Jesus says in Matthew 23, you Pharisees, you lay burdens on people Mm. and you do not help them. And that's their teaching about the Sabbath to a T. And and that might be, to be honest, uh, the the way that many of us uh, have come to view the Sabbath. It feels almost like it's doing the opposite of what you're explaining here. It's this burdensome day full of rules, uh, whether that's that's how, you know, we as Christians were brought up to think about Sundays or how we view the way the Sabbath worked out in terms of Judaism. When we criticize the Pharisees, we have to be very careful. We're not standing on a pedestal wagging our finger mm. at them because what they slipped into is exactly what we're capable of. And we ought to be asking ourselves, is there a a lingering pharisaical spirit Mm. in my heart as I think about this day? It's, it's, I can't say, well, that's just the Pharisees and I'm immune from this. What's going on in their heart and lives is something that can go on in my heart and life. Mm. And it's telling what Jesus does often on the Sabbath, and this enrages the Pharisees, is he heals people. And when Jesus heals people on any day of the week, these are signs and pointers to the great work of redemption, body and soul, that he's come to accomplish Mm. in his life, death, and resurrection. Mm. That's what the Sabbath is really about. It's drawing our attention and our focus on Christ so that we would delight in him, that we would worship him, and that we would serve him. Mm. Maybe as a last question, and and at the risk of laying down uh, extra biblical rules as the Pharisees had done, um, what what encouragement for the Christian listening right now who says, I want to maybe be more thoughtful and intentional about Sundays and and this, this day of rest that God has given to us as uh, as New Covenant believers, a day to, to focus our attention perhaps more on uh, the redemption that God is, is working. Well, what, what practical advice or ideas or thoughts would you give to someone who's, how can I, how can I do that? How can I honor the Sabbath uh, on Sundays in a meaningful way? Yes. Well, I think the first thing that we do, it's the, not the only thing, but it's the most important thing, is that we, we say, I'm going to prioritize this day as the day God has given me for rest and worship. Mm. And when you look at it that way, planning for that day starts not on Saturday night. It starts on Monday morning. Mm. I'm going to arrange my week because God has given me six days to do what I need to do. He says that's enough. I'm going to take him at his word. And then I'm, I'm going to take this day and I'm going to devote that day to worship and rest. So that's going to start very simply with, I'm going to join with 
God's people, the congregation I'm part of, weekly to worship them. There, there are lots of distractions, lots of things that could take me away, but I'm going to commit. My family and I are going to be there. Mm. We're going to be worshiping. We're going to be enjoying fellowship. And then we work, our, work out from there, yeah. find ways to, to use the rest of the day in a way that would honor the Lord. Yeah, I think that's, that's helpful to, uh, to start there because some of it is just, it is that whole week, thinking strategically and intentionally about the whole week in order to meaningfully set aside one day, Sunday, as a day to be intentional about worship yes. and rest. And that's exactly God's point. He is Lord over everything, and that includes our time. So if we're thinking about the subject of the Sabbath, all right, I'll give God this day, but the rest belongs to me. That misses the point. Mm. Every hour of the day belongs to God. And so the way that I'm spending my Monday morning or my Thursday afternoon or my Sunday morning is a point or two, an expression of my love for Jesus Christ. Mm. And so it, it really casts the way that we think about our time, our commitments, how we spend our time, what we're doing across the week in a way that, that God wants. He, he wants mm. us to, to live under his lordship consciously. Yeah. How, as a parent, how have you sought to uh, inculcate that sense for Sundays in your children? Because I think it can be easy to, the emphasis can be so rightly on corporate worship, on gathering together, and how do you how do you make the idea of Sabbath bigger than just that, just going to church, right. as important as that is? Yeah. Well, I think one thing parents can do, and I wish I had done this more, my children are older, mm-hmm. I wish I had done this more when they were younger, is to pause and explain, this is why we do what we do. So often, life just moves on at a pace. It's all you can do just to live it, yeah. second to second, yeah. much less to stop and pause and think about it. But that's a great opportunity mom and dad have mm. with their kids, particularly when, as a family, our life may look a little different from our neighbors or from what's going on in the community. Why do we do this? Mm. Many people uh, who do this is going to church on Sunday, every Sunday. Yeah. And that's a wonderful teaching moment. And it's a good way for mom and dad to be reminding themselves, (laughs) yeah, this is what we're about. Yeah. This is what God wants us to do. Mm. Yeah. Well, Guy, thank you so much for taking the time to to help us understand this really central biblical theme. As you pointed out, we see all the way back at the very beginning of our Bibles that still is relevant for us today. Thank you so much, Matt. That was Guy Waters on the Sabbath. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, The Sabbath as Rest and Hope for the People of God. Pick up your copy of the book for 30% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org slash plus. That's crossway.org slash plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. That really helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.